All right, praise the Lord, you guys. Thank you so much, praise team. You guys are always awesome, always right on target. Uh, ministers to my heart. You know, I guess when you love the Lord, anything about him ministers to, you, to your heart. <laughs> you know, really, when you think about it, it doesn't matter what it is, just so it's about him and some exaltation and some praise and some worship to him. You know, praising the Lord just simply means bragging on him. You do, mean, you do know that, right? I mean, it's nothing really complicated when you say, oh, excuse me, when you say praise the Lord, you, you, you're just bragging on him. So whatever follows that, if it's going to be a praise, it's going to be some bragging on Jesus. And uh, it's just wonderful, and I love that. We're in a series. This is the last message of this series, by the way. And so you guys have made it all the way to the end, right? Yes. With 10 laws each week. I mean, I barely can get one point, you know, and, and you know, just in case you wondered, I, I do think that every message needs to have at least one point, all right? <laughs> yeah, all right. So it, it, most of mine have three points, and I barely can get through them, but these have 10, and it's been 10 all the way through, 10 laws of my mind. I'm going to change my life. I'm going to be different. I don't want to be like I am. Okay, how do you do that? Well, Pastor, you've been preaching for 50 years. You've been living as a Christian for 52, 52 years. Um, how do you do it? Uh, I want to be like that. Uh, I, I want be, to be somebody that could be an example so that people might see me and want Jesus. They would like to be around me. They like it when I'm there. They like to talk to me. They like my presence. Why? Well, there are certain aspects of my life that must be true. And the Bible is filled with instructions on how to do that. The only problem is many times we get overwhelmed because there are so many and they're in so many locations and, they, and some of them are attached to other contexts and so forth. So how do you do it? Well, that's what the mission of this series has been, uh, ch Change Your Life, is, okay, tell me the most important things about my mind that the Bible says. So I gave you 10 laws concerning your mind that the Bible, really, th these are the big 10 things. And then we talked about our mouth, which by the way is very vital in the Christian life. Uh, the Bible's filled with information about it, what we say, how we say it, uh, the way we present ourselves, our words, our thoughts, because it's out of the abundance of our heart that our mouth speaks. So if you want to change your mouth, you have to change your heart. It's really what it boils down to. You don't try to change your words, you try to change your heart. Then your words will follow your heart. And then uh, one of the more mundane areas of life that all of us have to deal with all the time are our resources, our finances, our money, uh, does the Bible have anything to say? Well, surely it does. Lots of stuff to say about how to handle it, what to do with it, what it's for, how to treat it, what to think about it, uh, you know, how to not let it overwhelm you and become the focus of your life, all that kind of stuff. And then last week was marriage. And, you know, marriage is a very... Um, a, a very ordained purpose from God. It is a, it's the focus, it's the key to his major command that he gave right off the bat in Genesis 3, that we would, that we would uh, subdue the earth and that we would fill the earth and that humanity would continue and so forth. Well, there's only one problem. <laughs> Men and women are not even close to the same. We don't like the same things generally. We don't think the same way. We don't have the same goals in life. We don't even speak the same language. We think we do, but we, we don't. And so there are many things that need to be understood about how to live together, to be happy, to be productive, to be a, a witness as a couple, and, and how to have a great life and a great marriage. It's really simple, only one big law and then I gave you five ways for men to fulfill it and five ways for women. The big law, just in case some of you guys missed it last week that are out here watching now, go back and watch it. I think it'll be worth your while, is uh, women need to be loved and men need to be respected. And you can see this everywhere. 
It's just a fact. Uh, men interpret respect as love. But anyway, that was last week's message. Let's move on today. All right, today we look at the title of today's message, and it says, 10 Laws of Family Support. And everybody goes, wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> family support. That's got to be dull, Pastor. You know, it's family support stuff. Well, I just couldn't think of a better title is, is the problem, I think, with this thing. Because uh, the Bible makes it clear. Well, let me, just, let me just start it this way. The Apostle Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians said this to the church at Corinth. Now, listen to what he said. This is in chapter 1. Now, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So what is Paul encouraging the church at Corinth? He says, guys, it is vital that you guys, you group of people, you family, you church, that you not only believe the same things, but that you all speak the same things. Because unity is very, very powerful. And it produces some tremendously awesome results. And so I believe that God will encourage people of like values, like interest, of like callings, if you want to say this. You look at your life this way. I know we all think of pastors as being called, missionaries as being called, worship leaders as being called, but do you know that all of your lives are called by God? That you have a purpose? That you're not just, you know, not sitting on a log somewhere, uh, sucking up the anointing and being happy about Jesus? That he has a purpose for you? That he, that he draws us together with our mates? He produces children from that unity. We, if we're not married, we have friends, and these friends have been drawn, and we have common interests, we have common goals, we have common uh, desires in life. And so whether you have been drawn by God into a partnership that is a marriage or whether it's just a friendship, look, there's a ministry in that. There is, there is an intention that God has in your life because Unity is the most powerful of all uh, uh, mindsets in the kingdom of God especially. And let me give you the 10 laws now of this support. Why, why did God do this? What does God intend in this? How do we do this? All right, here it is. Law number one is the law of purpose. Purpose just simply means an assignment. So God has given you an assignment. And if God has called you to a wife or a husband, a mate, God has an assignment for your family. And God has put husbands and wives together that have the same assignment from him. Tanya and I have been married for 44 years. We dated for three years before we got married because we were too young to get, get married. All of our life, we have sensed the same assignment. 16 years old, 17 years old, and all the years between there and 66, we've, been, we've had the same assignment from God. He drew us together and gave us a purpose, and we're pursuing that purpose at all, at all times, and it's difficult a lot. But God has done the same thing with you. I want you to know this and I want you to believe this. You say, well, I'm just a machinist or I, I'm in the Navy or I work at a, a local manufacturing or a retail store. Well, God has given you an assignment and he's placed you with someone that has a similar assignment and now you have an assignment as your family. And it's, it, it, it's the law of purpose. God just didn't attract you. Out of, look, out of all the people in the world, why were you attracted to the one you were attracted to? I mean, out of all of the people that you encountered in life and nobody went ding in your heart and then finally one day he walked in or she walked in and it was <gasps> presto, I mean, you know, icy fingers running up and down my spine, you know, two, two eyes meet across the room and whoo, you know, what is that? Well, that's an attraction and I believe God does these kinds of things because he has a purpose for us. In Acts chapter 18, 
It's a chapter about a husband and wife team that ends up being great ministers for the kingdom of God. And this husband and wife team end up encountering two of the greatest ministers that have ever lived on the face of this earth. The Apostle Paul meet them. By the way, their names are Aquila and Priscilla. And the Apostle Paul meets them. He senses an anointing in them. He sees that they have tools that can be very useful in ministry. And then he spends time mentoring them and training them and teaching them. And they not only become great ministers from that, they become tremendous friends with the Apostle Paul. And a little bit later on, Aquila and Priscilla are used by God through the mentoring that Paul has put in their life to touch and teach one of the most fiery evangelists that the kingdom has ever had, a young minister by the name of Apollos. And they help him become everything God called him to be. What am I saying? I'm saying that God puts us together for a purpose. We have an assignment. Let me just show you uh, this Aquila, Priscilla, and so forth. Uh, Acts 18, few verses here, just a few verses. Acts 18, verse 24. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, a mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So Apollos doesn't know about Jesus. He only knows about John the Baptist who said, make way for the kingdom. One's coming that I can't even untie his shoelaces. So Apollos is fiery. Apollos is brilliant. Apollos is eloquent. And he just persuades everybody. He has that draw of evangelism on his life but he only knows the baptism of John. So he doesn't know about the cross. He doesn't know about the resurrection. He doesn't know about the grace of God that extends to everybody. And so Aquila and Priscilla, verse 26, so he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and they explained to him the way of God more accurately. In other words, they upgraded Apollos to understand grace and mercy and forgiveness. And he became the great orator of the kingdom of God. And then they have a church in their home. And look at this in verse Romans 16. Greet Aquila and Priscilla, my fellow workers in Jesus Christ, who risked their own necks for my life. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. To whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. All the churches of the Gentiles. Everybody say, that's us. All the churches of the Gentiles owe something to a husband and wife that God put together and gave up an assignment and a purpose in life. And, look, and likewise, greet the church that is in their home. So now they have a church in the house. Do you, are you aware that for the first 300 years of Christian ministry, there were no Christian churches anywhere? There were no buildings anywhere. You know why? Because it was illegal. It's probably going back to that. As a matter of fact, one day, I anticipate that. Uh, I'm not a Debbie Downer. But I would anticipate that there's going to come a time if things keep going like they're going right now, uh, that we'll, we'll, we'll have to be a little secretive about what goes on and what we do in our life. But anyway, the point being that uh, I believe that God can bless your home, will bless your home, will put you together for a purpose. Uh, let me read what I, what, well, actually, Pastor Tanya wrote this. Uh, she wrote this in some study notes that we had on this particular topic and I put them in your handout notes that I gave you if, you, if you have the handout. I'm just gonna read it real quick, all right? Do you know what your assignment from God is? If you're not sure, examine areas of sensitivity you may have concerning certain aspects of ministry. Usually heightened areas of sensitivity or awareness are God's direction of purpose for your life. For example, do you find yourself keenly interested in what's happening with our children's ministry or our youth ministry? Are you more sensitive than average to the fact that newcomers need to feel welcome and they need to feel included? Do you feel passionate about financial stability in the lives of Christians or marital stability in the lives of Christians? Are you driven to present the gospel to the lost or to encourage believers with the word? 
What are you passionate about? This is the question of purpose. And it doesn't have, these are all questions concerning ministry like church, different aspects we have going on in the church, but it could be about anything in life that has to do with the kingdom of God. God has put you together and God has given you a purpose. And remember, Aquila and Priscilla both had the same assignment and both had this powerful anointing from God and this tremendous purpose. They were a team. God has put you together as a team. All right, law number two the law of agreement. Ecclesiastes 4.9, two are better than one because they have good reward for their labor. That's just simply saying two can get more work done than one, and we all know that. All right, let's move on. Matthew 18. Again, this is Jesus speaking. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. So agreement has tremendous power for both good and bad. Ananias and Sapphira were a husband and wife in the book of Acts chapter five. They sold a piece of property. They wanted to look good at church. So they came down, uh, I can't remember if it was Ananias that came first or Sapphira. One, one came and it's been a while since I've read, uh, one came and came to the church and, and said Peter to Peter who was preaching, he said, hey, we sold this land. We want to give all the money to the church. And he said, Peter said, Ananias, why are you lying to, to God? And Ananias fell dead right there at the altar. They drug him out. They had no sooner gotten him dragged out of the uh, church than his wife comes in with the same story. And she comes down and says, we sold this land and we're gonna give all the money to the church. And Peter said, why do you lie to the Holy Spirit? And boom, she fell out dead at the altar. I, I'm sure that no one joined the church that day. I, I'm sure no one else came to the altar for anything. But the point is they agreed together to try to deceive God and to deceive the church and it led to bad results. In the Old Testament, there's a little known story about a man named Achan. I call him Achan Achan and you'll see why in a second. Because Achan stole some goods from Jericho. You remember God said when the walls fall, you just leave it alone, don't take anything. Don't take anything. And Achan goes in there and takes some Babylonian garments and some gold and he takes them back and puts them in his tent and buries them in his tent. And his wife agrees with this and, is, and, and she says, okay, we'll do this. Well, the next little city that they came up against was a city named A-I. A, spell it A-I. And it was about as big as its name. And, and A-I tore Israel up. Man, Israel tucked its tail running. I mean, it, they kill bunches of Israeli soldiers and they, man, they just, AI routed Israel. And, Jay, and, and Joshua went to God and said, God, what happened? <laughs> we were doing so well. He said, look, you got somebody that's done some stuff and uh, you got to find them. And they narrowed it down. They finally found Achan and his wife and they took Achan and his wife and his children, all his family, stoned them to death right there in the camp, killed every one of them. Bad choices. Agreement, though. That was an agreement. Adam and Eve agreed together to sin against God. <laughs> they both partook of the sin, and look where we are now. I mean, your family gives you a tremendous opportunity to minister goodness or to tremendously, or to make tremendously bad agreement decisions based on the law of agreement. Don't take that lightly. That is a tremendous law of God. Law number three, the law of failure. It is possible and even likely that as you walk in your purpose as a, as a, as a family, that even though you have a great anointing for the job that God has called you to, it is extremely likely that you are going to experience somewhere along the way failure, discouragement, and weakness. And yes, I am speaking from experience. Well, what's God gonna do about it? Well, enter the third law, 
Let's look at Ecclesiastes again, chapter four. We read verse nine about two being better than one. Let's add a few more verses that follow that. Verse nine, Ecclesiastes four, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Well, what would that be? Next verse, or verse, you know, next verse 10. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion, but woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. This is the power or the law of failure. It just says you're going to fail sometimes. You're going to get discouraged sometimes. You need somebody to pick you up. And if you have someone that has the same purpose and that you're in agreement with, they can lift you up and a threefold cord. I, T- Pastor Tanya and I have taught this for all of our life, the prayer of three, which just simply means find two believers that will agree with you and pray together about something in agreement with each other. And it is tremendously, it, 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 tremendously powerful. I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it's magic, but I'm, I guarantee you, if you'll, it, you can see this and it, it's very, it, it happens very quickly. And we've used it many, many times on things that we had no control over. It is the power of encouragement, the power of agreement is tremendous. All right, that's the law of failure. You need somebody. Lump, law number four, the law of hospitality. We're all brought up with certain filters in life, right? Uh, Are you aware that different parts of the country have different filters that that we're brought up with? Have you ever met somebody from another part of the country and they seemed rude or nasty or arrogant or straightforward or whatever they seemed? You know why they seemed that way? Because they have different filters. Well, in the South, we have a filter that pretty much automatically fulfills this law. We have a hospitality filter in the South. Uh, very hospitable people, generally speaking, very gracious to others and, and, and kind and so forth. Uh, maybe because we don't have as many people down here, that could have a lot to do with it. But, but anyway, regardless, the, 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 the law of hospitality, because the Christ life is a compassionate life. And in the Christ life, you are going to encounter strangers sometimes, and many times people that you don't know very well And the scripture teaches us to be compassionate toward that and to be hospitable toward other people. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews chapter 13, it talks about sometimes we even entertain angels unaware. So we're being encouraged that 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 hospitality uh, is a is a way to receive God's blessing. And you want to be hospitable to everyone. Well, in 2 Kings chapter 4, there is a story of a great woman. Her nationality is that she is a Shunammite woman. And the prophet Elisha encounters her and her husband in his ministry as he goes through his prophetic ministry in the land of Shushan. Let me read the story real quickly for you, all right? 2 Kings chapter four, here it is, verse eight. Now it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem where there was a great woman, a great woman. It just means that she was notable and noteworthy. She was a wonderful person. Everybody loved her, a great woman. And she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. And she said to her husband, look now, I know that this is a holy man of God that passes by us regularly. Please let us make a small upper room on the wall and let us put a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand so it will be whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. And it happened one day that he came there and he turned into the upper room and lay down there. It was a prophet's room is what what some people have called that. Verse 12, then, he, then Elisha said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite woman. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And Elisha said to Gehazi, say now to her, look, you've been concerned for us with all this care. What can I do for you? 
Do you want me to speak to, on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. I, pray, <laughs> I, don't, I don't need any help, is what she said. I, I got it. I don't, you don't need to talk to anybody for me. Uh, verse 14, so he said, uh, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, well, actually, she has no son and her husband is old. So he said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway. Then Elisha said, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. In other words, she's saying, don't get my hopes up. Don't, don't, don't wake me up. I've already put that... That, that, that desire to bed. I'm old, it can't happen. And I, I, don't get me all stirred up believing something that, that can't happen now, man of God. Verse 17, but the woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come of which Elisha had told her. Now, the point I don't want you to miss out of this story is a very small one. I just wanted you to hear the story because I like it. But... Uh, I want you to get the principle. This is the principle, don't miss. Teamwork. The teamwork of this. She felt the need. Her husband built it. Her compassion envisioned the room. He built it. God rewards that spirit of hospitality. Nothing fancy. I mean, you don't have to go out of your way to make some, you know, extraordinary thing. Just, just, just opening your home or your, or, your, or your heart to be compassionate to others is what the law of hospitality is all about. And God calls us to be hospitable and compassionate because we represent Christ. Law number five, the law of order. Now, I covered the law of order in one aspect in the 10 laws of the mind. And the aspect I covered in the 10 laws of the mind was if your mind is all messed up, if it's blown, if it's, if it's just helter-skelter and, and it's, it's in bad shape, the law, you, you, you need the law of order to help get it healed. A, a, a scattered mind can't heal in disorder. You need order for it to help you heal and peace, obviously. So God is a God of order. Let's look at another aspect here in this family support. God is a God of order. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, I think I've got it on here. 40, let all things be done decently and in order. And you know that by heart. Look at 1 Corinthians eleven three, 3, and, and, and it'll describe the order that God wants things to operate in. Verse 3, 1 Corinthians 11. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, this principle of order is passionately fought against by the God of this world. As a matter of fact, we see this now more distinctly than ever. All forms of God's order are being attacked ferociously now in these days. It, almost everything that is perpetrated is undermining the family Gender issues, uh, there are only two, by the way, not 50, like some crazy people say. Uh, racial issues, uh, radical issues, uh, all of that, every bit of that intended, it all moves against the order of God, lawlessness, all of that. The... Law of order is like an umbrella of protection for us. 
And when the law of order is missing or if it's disregarded, you could have some devastating uh, uh, situations and consequences. Ahab and Jezebel in the Old Testament, 1 Kings 21. In verse 25, look at what it says. But there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him to evil. So Jezebel, his mate, his wife, actually encouraged him to be more wicked than he would normally have been on his own. I'm going to tell you, nothing stirs the heart of men to the good or to the bad more than women. They ha- you, ladies, you have a tremendous power to influence us either to the good or to the bad. Well, what do we learn from Ahab and Jezebel? Well, we learn that Ahab is a passive man and that Ahab just was like a toad that squatted on the throne of Israel. So guys, we are commanded by God to be active and to be aggressive in our leadership for the Lord. We are the protectors, the providers, and the priests of our home, and God holds us responsible for this. We are to be aware of everything to do with our home. We are to be on top of everything that has to do with our home. There's no, are we going to church today? Well, ask your mama. No, you are the one that decides. God holds you responsible. And the tithe, you get shocked because she hadn't been paying the tithe for the last four weeks. Look, it's not her responsibility. It's your responsibility. God holds you responsible for things that happen in your home, to discipline the children, the order of the home, to maintain the home, make, make sure everything's working at the house and nothing's broken up and torn down and been hanging around for the past six months. How are the children doing in school? You gotta know. This is what God holds us responsible, to be aggressive and to be active in all the issues of our home. Men, we cannot be passive or lazy or fearful because there is an enemy out there that is trying to destroy our family and our children and our lives. You the man is what it boils down to. And if you won't be the man, your wife will try to be the man. And you know what it'll do to her? It'll destroy her. It's upside down. It'll mess her up. It won't work. And if she doesn't try it, if you've got a son, especially if he's an older son, he'll try to be the dad. And because that's out of order, it's gonna mess up everything, just like David and Absalom. You remember King David and Absalom, his son, tried to take the kingdom away from him? You know why Absalom did that? Because King David was such a pitiful father that he wouldn't discipline his own children. And Absalom was his oldest son, and Absalom saw it and said, well, if dad's not gonna do anything about it, I'm gonna have to be the man of the house. And he ended up trying to take the whole kingdom away from his dad because Amnon, his half-brother, raped his sister Tamar, and David just twiddled his thumb and said, oh, uh, no, 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 dad, no, no. The law of order says you are responsible. Genesis 3, 6, this, the law is so powerful that the devil tried to use it to destroy the entire world. Uh, look at this, Genesis 3, 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, uh, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband who was with her, who was with her, and he ate. Adam sits there like a bump on a bullfrog while the enemy intimidates and seduces his wife to sin against God. Everybody say, out of order. (laughs) Adam, you gotta be a man, son. This is your job. Get him away. Run him off. Take over, man. Don't just sit there like a bump on a bullfrog. Uh, Joseph and Mary. Joseph and Mary were a couple who had proper order. You remember the angel Gabriel came and spoke to Mary and told her that she was favored of God and don't be afraid because that inner was placed there by the Holy Spirit. Well, four months later, and why he waited, I don't know. We'll talk about it again at Christmas time. But 
Um, he waited four months to tell, to tell Joseph about this. Mary's showing by now. Joseph has already decided to put her away privately. He's already got the divorce papers written up. And then Gabriel says, hey man, uh, tear the papers up. Uh, you don't need to divorce her. That, that's from God. And when Gabriel spoke to, to Joseph, do you know that Gabriel never again spoke to Mary? He talked to Joseph from then on. He talked to him three more times. He told Joseph to take Jesus down into Egypt because Herod was gonna try to kill him. And then he said, you stay there till I tell you to come out. And then he spoke to him when he was down in Egypt and said, okay, it's safe to come home now. And then he spoke to him again while he was on his way back and said, hey, don't go to Judea. Don't go to Jerusalem. Go to Galilee, go to Nazareth. That's where you need to go. And he redirected him. And so God puts order in our life because order makes the world go round. And if, our, if we are out of order, we don't have any ministry. Now, I'm not telling you that if you have a husband who is gone or a husband who is lost and doesn't know the Lord or you're single, I'm not telling you that you don't have a ministry. You do have a ministry. I'm just telling you that the law of order is vital in our life. And remember, the anointing of God flows from the head down. You remember Aaron's robe and the anointing on his beard and it would trickle down and the subjugate priest just got it off the bottom of his robe down here. I mean, the anointing of God moves from headship down. If the head's out of order, the anointing is not going anywhere. It's not there. All right, law number six, enough of that. Law number six, the law of balance. I think you'll like this one. This law says, if you had all the emotional qualities that you needed, God would not have given you a partner. Let me say that again. The law of balance says, if you had all the emotional qualities that you needed, God would not have given you a partner. Um, Emotions, let's talk about. Uh, the wife balances the husband's anger. All of us men are prone to anger occasionally, some more than others. And God uses your wife to balance you out. It's like, Grace, her grace balancing out you, the law, okay? And husbands, you balance out your wife's fearfulness. This is conquest balancing out compassion. Let me, let me show you one incident of this, and I'll talk more about this in a second. This is 1 Samuel 25. This is a woman by the name of Abigail who encounters King David who is on his way to kill her husband Nabal because he's an idiot. Um, and he really is. The name Nabal means foolish. And his wife even says, you know, his name is Nabal and he certainly lives up to his name. And what he had done, and just to make it in a nutshell because you'll appreciate it. Well, what, he had done, what he had done is David had kept his uh, shepherds safe from harm for some period of time so nobody stole his sheep, nobody killed his shepherds. In other words, David put a hedge of protection around Nabal's shepherd, sheep and stuff even though he didn't even know Nabal. Well, then when David starts having to run for his life from Saul, David has 400 men with him and they're on the run and they come into the area of Nabal and David takes two of his men and said, go up there and talk to Nabal because, hey, I had some dealings with Nabal a couple of years ago and he'll be friendly to you because he'll just tell them David sent you. Uh, the son of Jesse sent you. And, they, and he'll treat you right and he'll give us some food and some wine and other things that we need. So they go up there and they encounter Nabal and Nabal said, who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? And sent him away. And they went back and told David, and David said, saddle up, boys. 
400 men now. Get your swords. Come on. We're going, everybody there is going to die. Every man in that camp is going to die. Let's go. Let's, I mean, hey, they're not going to insult us like that. One gracious you know, person like that. Man, those kind of people need to die. Let's go get them. And so four, David and 400 men, and remember, hit David's 300 killed giants and everything. I mean, man, now you had to have a prayer on this deal now. And Abigail, Nabal's wife, hears about it, and she cooks like 500 raisin cakes, uh, 600 loaves of bread. She takes uh, five sheep and, and kills them and slaughters them and brings the meat down there and big old uh, urns of wine and everything. And she's coming down, and she runs into David and, and his men, and when she sees them, she runs off of her little wagon, and she bows, and she bows down, and she says, you know, uh, I'm Abigail, your servant, and I brought you all these things because my stupid husband husband Nabal doesn't have enough sense to get out of the rain. Please don't, I mean, he's horrible, but I love him. So please accept this as our apology to you. And I wish your men had come to me. And if they'd come to me, then we wouldn't have all of this because I would have done all this to start with. But Nabal, Nabal is foolish, just like his name says he is. So please don't, don't kill him. And here's what David said, verse 32. Then David said to Abigail, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. And blessed is your advice and blessed are you because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own hand. David says, thank God you stopped me. Thank God you stopped me. Guys, listen, God has given you a wife to balance you out. In the area of anger that we men can be so prone to, when we are disrespected, when we are threatened, we are, we are uh, prone to unbelievable anger. And it can be against our wife, it could be against our children, it could be against our neighbor, I mean, when our anger gets out of control, we just a little, a little cray cray, you know? I mean, we, we just a little on the, on the wild side of life. That's why we don't like to get mad because we don't want to feel that way. And we are usually the biggest and baddest and strongest gorilla in the kingdom. And we can do tremendous damage physically and emotionally to the children, uh, to our wives, we can be very abusive and to everybody in, involved. Remember, God has put your wife in your life to be an Abigail to you. So men, when you get so angry that you can spit fire, when you get so angry that you could just tear somebody's head off and your wife comes up to you and pats you and says, now, hon, you need to settle down. This is not of the Lord. You need to look at her and say, you're right. Because what you've just experienced is God's gift to you. It's called the gift of balance. And ladies, when you're all fearful and you're all anxious and you're fretting over something, and you're all beside yourself about it, nervous and anxious about this thing. I just want you to know that your husband does not feel the same way. So when he comes up and pats you and says, sweetheart, you need to relax now. There's nothing to worry about here. I got this. Don't worry. You need to look at him and you need to say, you're right. Because what you have just experienced is a gift of God to you. It is called the gift of balance. All right, law number seven. The law of priesthood. I gotta hurry. I got four minutes to do four. All right, let me get it to you real quick. The law of priesthood just simply means that God cares about everybody in your family. Not just you, he cares about everybody in your family. Gen Let me show you a priestly family, Genesis 7, 1. Then the Lord said to Noah, this is a priestly family. 
Then the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. So Noah's whole family, his entire family was righteous with God. It wasn't just Noah and Miss Noah. It was him and all of his family and they all went. So the law of the pre, law of priesthood says God's interested in your entire family, not just you and your wife, he, your kids, everybody. Now, I love what, what Moses said to Pharaoh when, when, he, when he challenged Pharaoh to let the people go and Pharaoh said, who's going with you? And, and Moses said, well, my wife's going my children are going, the dogs are going, the cats are going, the sheep are going, the cattle are going, the oxen are going, the goats are going, everybody's going. We are not leaving one hoof behind down here. That was Moses saying, hey, God's taken all of us out of this place together. God is interested in your whole family. Can we believe God? Can we pray and believe that God can save our entire family and that he wants to do this? You know, four times in the book of Acts, God saves somebody and then saves their entire family. Cornelius, at Cornelius' house, he gets saved and then his whole family and all his relatives get saved. Lydia, the seller of purple, she gets saved. And then everybody in her family gets saved. And we all know about the Philippian jailer. He gets saved and then his whole household gets saved and baptized. And then Crispus, who was a ruler at the, sanctuary, at the synagogue, he gets saved, all his family gets saved. Remember, God is interested in Everyone in the, in the house being saved. All right, that's the law of priesthood. All right, law number eight, the law of inheritance. This law says God uses one generation to transfer the anointing in greater strength to the next generation. It was like Elisha and Elijah. Elijah was the old man prophet. Elisha was his young prophet student. And when God came to get Elijah, he sent a chariot of fire. It came down, and when it came down to get Elijah, Elisha, who was there, said, grant me a double portion of your anointing. And he got a double portion of Elijah's anointing. The law of inheritance says that one generation transfers the anointing in greater strength to the next generation. Let me read you a, a passage. Nailer, you'll have to skip to Malachi 2. 2.15. All right, we'll start with verse 14. Yet you say, this is God speaking, for what reason? Well, because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth with whom you've dealt treacherously, yet she's your companion and your wife by covenant. We saw that last week. Let's add verse 15. But he did not make them one having a remnant of the Spirit. And why one? So here's, here's the question. Why did God make you one? Why did God call you together? Why did God bring you to each other? What is God's reason for drawing you to each other? Look at what the verse says. He seeks godly offspring. That's what God wants from you and me. Godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. So, uh, this deals with generational blessings and generational curses and so forth, but just let's just say uh, God wants to pass down your anointing through your children to the next generation, and it will be more powerful when the next generation gets it than it is when you have it. All right, let's go on. I'll come back on that one day. Law number nine, the law of peace. The law of peace deals with, with the out-of-whack issues of relationships. Can relationships have out-of-whack issues? Sure they can, Right? I mean, we can get all out of whack with, with, with each other. And in 1 Corinthians 7, the Apostle Paul talks about what we should do when we have real problems with each other. And he talks about divorce and what's okay and what's not okay. And I just want to say to you that uh, the Bible talks about divorce and it, talks, it gives some restrictions about adultery and about uh, abandonment and so forth. But let me just say to you, if you're being abused, get, get out of that. Now, you don't have to divorce them. But you need to get away. If you're being abused emotionally or physically, let me tell you what's gonna happen. It's gonna get worse. It's not gonna get better, it's gonna get worse, and you're gonna end up dead or, or wishing you were dead. Uh, it's bad. Get away from there, 
Uh, you can negotiate from a distance and see if you can put your marriage back together and so forth. But here's what our problem is in the area of marriage. And this is why we need the law of peace. Because we're all marred vessels. Can we get an amen on that? <laughs> Are you a marred vessel? You know what I mean, right? You got some scars on you. You got some cracks in you, right? Okay. We're all marred vessels, pretending that we're really not marred. So what we have is we have two marred vessels that get interested in each other and we marry each other thinking that we're both whole. Well, after we've been married a few weeks or maybe a few months or whenever the honeymoon wears off, uh, we discover <laughs> we're, we're both not whole. And then we have the audacity to get angry about the fact that our mate has cracks that we didn't know about in life. So what we have to realize, just look, realize this. You, as a Christian, are on the potter's wheel. You say, what is the potter's wheel? The book of Jeremiah, the prophet, Jeremiah said that God has a wheel that he puts us on because we're marred vessels. We're pots that need to be reshaped and redone. And so God's got a wheel and he puts it, us on it. Now, any old potter can redo something that's new and soft clay, but it takes the master potter to take old clay and, and hard clay and reshape <laughs> that old clay and that hard clay. So realize, look, we're, not, we're all marred. Every one of us are marred. None of us are perfect. And God is in the process of reshaping us because he is the master potter and he can take this old hard clay, stubborn clay, ridiculous clay, opinionated clay, uh, aggravating clay, he can take it and make it clean again. So remember that. God didn't call you to fix somebody. Quit trying to fix people. That's God's business. Law number 10, the law of self-control. 1 Corinthians 7, but I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it's good for them if they remain even as I am. This is the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul saying, I've got the gift of celibacy, which means I don't need sex and I don't, so I don't need to be with anybody because that's not a need in my life. Now that is a gift from God. Most people don't have it. If they did have it, there would be no babies in the world. So there are very few people that have this gift. I have met some that do. And if that's you, it's better for you not to get married uh, you're not going to meet the need of the other one because they probably don't have that gift. And, you, don't, you know, you're just wasting your time and energy. You could be doing a lot more with other things. Verse 9, but, the, now he starts talking about the rest of us. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. <laughs> For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So if you can't control yourself sexually, get married because that's the thing you ought to do. So, the issue of this is control. And what he's saying here is you need to be under control. Now, in this passage, he's talking about being under control in the area of sexuality in your life. But if you put yourself in certain conditions, you're gonna be out of control. I would go through them. I, I would deal with, with them, but we're out of time. And... I tell you, this is such a crazy world we're in now. You know, people don't even think about this anymore, do they? Really, do they? People don't think about being uh, under control and not, uh, a vi not violating this command of God, right? I mean, just uh, not, I mean, people just live together. People just shack up. People just do, I mean, they don't even think about this. This is all in the scripture about the sacredness of these things. And then we want to pray for God to bless us, anoint us, use us, and blah, 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 in spite of the fact that we pay no attention to what he says about things. Now, I'm not trying to put you under condemnation, believe me. I mean, 
the Lord's the only one that can convict somebody and he's the only one that you need to talk to about it, <laughs> certainly. But this passage is speaking about being under control in this area. And I have had people <laughs> that have said, Pastor, I need deliverance. I need, because I just can't control myself. I'm to, and I need you to pray. I got a demon on me or something and I got this demon of sexuality or whatever. No, you don't. You know what most of deliverance is? Don't put yourself in the position <laughs> to be tempted. That's, what, that's most of deliverance. How can you get delivered from all this temptation and all this stuff? Don't put yourself in the position when you go home, when you drive her home and she lives alone and she says, do you have to go home now? Well, I don't know. Come get a cup of coffee. Yeah. yeah. Don't even pretend that you don't know what's fixing to happen. <laughs> you know what's fixing to happen. Now, you want to be delivered? Don't go in there. Don't go drink it. Go down, go down to the truck stop and get you some coffee. You know, there's plenty of people in there. All right, let's, let's bow our head, you know.